Well, Mike, thank you so much. It's great to be here in front of the entree, the, the tech expo in front of your attendees, staff, vendor partners, and clients. And you hit the nail on the head. Today, I want to talk to you about executing in chaos in rapidly challenging, difficult situations. And I think we can all relate to that right now. I mean, after all, we all feel like we're in the middle of a possibly chaos ruins. Maybe some of your customers feel that way since you're in the tech space. Maybe you're having a booming year like some of our clients out in Silicon Valley like VMware, Microsoft, Dell, and Oracle. However, I think as a landscape as a whole, we're all learning how to pivot and execute with these new challenges that face us right now. And I think one of the things that I learned as a fighter pilot is in chaos, there's great opportunity. In chaos, there's great opportunity. I trained and looked forward to chaos as a fighter pilot because I knew that I could exploit weaknesses in the defenses of our adversaries. And in business, I've understood that in chaotic situations, we can exploit markets in a very positive, uplifting way. And that's where I want to focus our time today. But before I get started, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you a quick video. Now, before we roll the video, I want to set this up for a minute. This video, I want you to watch in great detail. Now, it is a promotional video for Paramount's new movie, Top Gun Maverick. And I'm sure most of you have seen the old Top Gun. And I want you to think about that. That movie came out in 1986. Paramount's hoping for another blockbuster, another sequel. Maybe some of you are hoping for another blockbuster sequel after COVID-19, post-COVID. So I want you to think about the stakes are high for Paramount. Can they do this again? But I want you to watch this video in great detail. And I'm going to ask you a few questions about it after it rolls. So Kathy, if you don't mind going to YouTube real quick, let's plug this new movie. But more importantly, let's talk about it on the backside. Go ahead and roll the video. Your instructor is one of the finest pilots this program has ever produced. His exploits are legendary. What he has to teach you may very well mean the difference between life and death. Your reputation precedes you. I have to admit I wasn't expecting an invitation back. They're called orders, Maverick. of the video is, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been inspired by a song, a video, or maybe something else that compelled you so much, it got you out of your comfort zone? It caused you to do something that you thought was impossible. And I want you to think about our current situation that we're in right now. Because that movie, Top Gun, did exactly that for me. You know, I, I was a farm boy. I grew up on a farm in central Kentucky, went to 
the University of Kentucky on a baseball scholarship, I thought I was going to be a professional athlete. And that didn't work out. I didn't get drafted. And I went to work for a couple of years selling copiers door to door and facsimiles. And, you know, that really wasn't what I thought I was going to be when I grew up. So at the time, it was devastating. However, I met a fighter pilot. And this person was living with purpose, doing something not everybody could do. And that meaning inspired me to think about the military for the first time. It wasn't a poster. It wasn't a friend or a family member. It was this person that was living with purpose. So I decided to look into that. Hey, can a post-college grad actually enter that competitive pipeline and one day be a fighter pilot? Or did I have to go to the academy? And I was a jock after all, so my GPA wasn't the best and I wasn't an aerospace major. But a couple of weeks after that encounter, that gentleman invited me to come to the base and I got a chance to lower myself into the cockpit of a modern fighter jet. And it really moved me. And when I left that meeting with that jet, I said, I need to figure out the path to get here. And although nobody I knew or anybody even in my second or third order sphere knew anything about becoming a fighter pilot in the Air Force, Navy or Marines, I was going to try to figure it out. And then one week later, Top Gun came out. I was the first one to see the movie in my small hometown. And that movie, for the first time, put context, emotion, passion, music into the dream that I had. All of a sudden, my dream became real because of the details. I was being pulled to do something that I never thought was possible. And because that pulling mechanism was so strong, it was so real, I was going to figure out how to go from farm boy to fighter pilot. I would figure out the path. And eventually I did. I went through that pipeline of thousands down to eight. The eight top pilots in the Air Force that year went to Luke Air Force Base to fly arguably the most sophisticated jet on Earth at the time, the F-15 Eagle, and I got one of those seats. So I want you to think about this for a minute. 16 months after I made that decision to leave the farm, 16 months later, I was flying a $50 million single seat jet fighter that flies two times the speed of sound. And I had an epiphany as I was strapping the F-15 on for the first time to solo it at Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. And that epiphany was this, holy crap, how did they take a normal guy like me, Jim Murphy from central Kentucky and get me here in 16 months? I realized that I went through a framework, a process that had been codified over 50 years, a process that the Air Force can't even articulate themselves. Yeah, they can tell you about their technology, their deployments and their people, but not the frameworks that their elite teams used to survive, thrive, and dominate better than anybody else on earth. And I vowed after that flight that day that I was gonna learn this framework because I realized that if I could apply this framework to athletics, to business, to sales, maybe even life, it would change other people's lives like it changed mine. So I went on a quest to study this framework. And today it's called flawless execution. It's a methodology, a process, a heuristic, if you will, that will help you win in chaotic situations. Now, the first time I had an opportunity to test it out, it was with Home Depot. And I spent a year and a half with the Home Depot leaders around the country, helping them go from 300 stores to 2,000 stores. And after that work, our company was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Elite team of fighter pilots gets Home Depot to the number one admired retailer by Fortune Magazine. After that, obviously the phone started ringing and our company really came to fruition. So that's my story from farm boy to fighter pilot, but more importantly, it's the process that we articulate. It's the experiences that I wanna give you that will help you win. So to take a step back, you've already heard my bio. Mike went through that in excruciating detail. Thank you, Mike, for doing that. So you know I'm a former fighter pilot, but for the last 26 years, I've been working with companies like yours, helping you develop strategy and connecting it to execution, eliminate task saturation, build funnels, pipelines, conversion, work on projects and services, execution rhythm, if you will, but more importantly, teaching you this agile framework to help you and your business win. Now we've had an opportunity to be fairly successful in that space. We've done these seminars, these speaking engagements, this consulting work, in over 26 countries, over two and a half million people have been through our programs. Maybe you have seen some of those in the past. So that's enough about Afterburner, enough about Murph. Let's talk about your mission. 
the mission at hand. Whether you're an Entree staff member, a vendor partner, or a valued client, I want you to read this slide for a minute. And in case you can't read it, I'll read it to you. It says, you, and I want you to think about you personally, and your, that's your team, your company, your organization, you and your continued trajectory and success is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. Now, if I would have showed you that slide a year ago, I don't think it would have caused as visceral of a response as it is in you now. Because this pandemic has taught us that whatever we thought was safe, whatever we thought was not so risky, that's all been turned around, upside down. So we know now that our future is not guaranteed. And in business school, you were probably taught something like this. All businesses start somewhere, right? They develop a nice product, a nice service. People start buying it, margins start increasing, and this business just starts rocketing in profitability, growth, top line revenue. But eventually what happens? All businesses eventually level out. Competitors come into the space. It goes from a blue to a red ocean. Margins start to shrink. And unless that company does something fairly drastic, all companies will eventually die. Look at the S&P 500 today versus 20 years ago. Unless, obviously, you've done a great job figuring out at some point in your business life cycle to pivot or revitalize that business based on the external factors like the environment, the market, or maybe internal factors as well, or both. Now, there's one other thing, possibility. Obviously, you could be really smart and get out of the business before it flattens out at its maximum value, i.e. exit, IPO, something like that. But Basically, this is the lifestyle of any business. Now, notice this stage right here. As a former baseball player, I like to call this stage the hustle stage. This is where, whether you're an entrepreneurial company or a large enterprise working in a business unit, this is where leaders believe that if we just work harder, longer, and hustle better, that we'll continue to have the same successes we've had in the past. And I can tell you, that that is not necessarily true. We have been rewarding ourselves for hustle. But what I've learned over the last 26 years working with companies like yours and in elite combat teams, it's not about more hustle. It's really about something else that's much more powerful. And that's alignment. Aligning people, processes, and technology into the right things. But what are the right things, Murph? These are things that you have agreed with your team and planned for. I.e., you can't predict the future, but you can develop the future you'd like to have and work backwards from there. And in chaotic situations, we've got to get back out into the future. And we need to work backwards in our new market and our new reality. So this alignment is so important to you and your company. Now, let's dive into this a little bit further. Most companies aren't aligned. Most companies are rewarded for hustle. Most companies are what we call tactically focused. And I want you to look up here on this, on this board right now, and you see a bunch of different arrows, different colors going in different directions. I want you to imagine for a moment that each and every one of those arrows is a person on your team or maybe a department in your company. And here's what I know about each one of these different team members is they probably want to do the right thing for your company or organization, don't they? They're good people. They show up, they hustle. They want to do the right thing for you as a leader. But imagine if you were to tie a rope around each and every one of those arrows or those individuals or those departments. The rope was tied into the individuals. The other end of the rope was tied to the organization itself. Despite everyone's individual best efforts, which direction overall is this organization going? in no particular direction, unless one or two of these arrows is larger or stronger than the others. That's the whole 80-20 rule. And you get that three to 5% EBITDA bump, which is acceptable for the next quarter, and we just move on. Versus a strategically aligned organization. These are the same exact individuals, but these individuals are executing today, not based on what they think you want as a leadership organization, but they're executing today with a clear, compelling, high definition, destination, or future in mind. They have a collective consciousness. 
So they're executing today with that clear consciousness in mind that's pulling them into a destination. And notice how these arrows aren't in an all perfect 44.5 degree right hand echelon turn because we need individual creativity and collaboration in order to win in today's environment. But which type of organization do you want to be part of? A tactically focused one or an organ, a strategically aligned one? So I'm going to ask you a question like that movie. What is compelling or pulling your team members to do new things in this new environment? Because if you can't and you don't, you're in big trouble. So it's up to us as leaders to create that pulling mechanism that's compelling with high definition. So individual actions are aligned without us having to be over everybody's shoulders, making sure that everything is aligned. That's the power of this pulling mechanism. So in the military, we did that by having what we call leader's intent. And what was really cool in the military is I had an epiphany when I was a 24-year-old fighter pilot. I said, gosh, the other fighter pilots in my squadron are in our 20s and early 30s. And each one of us has a $50 million jet. And our bosses, our commanders, give us direction and then they allow us to go fly halfway across the world and execute a mission on their behalf. Usually a really important one. And then come back safely. I don't know if they've seen us at night, you know, after work at the bar, but I can believe that our commanders gave us that much autonomy and that much confidence in executing the end game. And why did they have that much confidence? How could they possibly get a good night's sleep before we launched on our missions? Well, it's because we were part of the plan. We were part of the strategy. We heard the arguments behind the hows and the whys. There was context. There was purpose. We understood every detail of the future, of what the battle space needed to become socially, politically, not just kinetically. Because our commanders knew that as soon as we launched that plan that looked so perfect on paper or on a spreadsheet might become irrelevant once we hit the enemy. So if we have the leader's intent, we can instantaneously make the right decision and still be aligned. Maybe we have to switch targets. Maybe we have to leave early or maybe we have to stay late, but we understand the future in great detail. I rarely see this in business because in business, what we normally get tactical details. We measure the tactics, the quarterly reports. We put a lot of detail in what we're going to do today, tomorrow, next week, but it's rarely aligned because the future is great doesn't have a lot of context. It's not very compelling. And sometimes because it's not compelling, we might find turnover in organizations and not a lot of alignment. So when you think about the futures and the way you communicate the future to your team, are you compelling them like that movie did for me? Or is it kind of the big picture like a recruiting poster, join the Air Force, go fly? It's the details that are important. You know, in business, it's almost like a building project. You know, you've got bricklayers, you've got masonry folks, you've got designers, you've got steel workers, you've got all these different components. But you know what? If the bricklayer gets a chance to see the architectural plans and maybe even a picture, a rendition of what the finished product looks like, we can ensure that as we're laying our bricks, they align to the right color, the context, and the overall project will be a lot better on budget and on time. So when you're building that future, you want everybody in the team to think like an architect. And it happens with the details. Now, you can't plan, you can't predict the future, but you can plan the one that you want in great detail. But first, everybody needs to know where the finish line is. I see so many plans that are way out there. I've heard about the Harley Davidson 100 year vision. How's that working out for Harley right now? Maybe great, I don't know. But to me, if I work for a company that has a vision that's 100 years out into the future, I don't know if I feel very relevant and contributing to that because I don't know if I'm going to be around in five years, much less 10 years with this company. So when you're building those futures, I would recommend that you have a definitive finish line where those details stop or we'll evaluate whether we cross the finish line. 
And here's what I've learned over the last 20 plus years. Five years used to be a really good number 10 years ago, but now three feels pretty good, especially in the technology space. So three to five years, I think is a good place to start. It's still urgent enough. It's far enough away to be strategic, but it's also relevant for everybody that's in that planning room. So understanding where the end in mind is important. Now, how do we put details into your business movie? Well, I know that eventually we need to know on that day, let's say January 1st, 2024, financially, in that current position, where is the company? Debt, debt to equity, uh, how much revenue or cash flow we're spending per month. The more details we can put into the financial dashboard, the better the company will be. Well, forget finances for a minute. How about market or market position? Where is the company on January 1st, 2024? What businesses are we in? And more importantly, what businesses aren't we in at that point? Human capital, structure, entrepreneurship, innovation. You need to create these buckets. And I recommend that you have seven to 12 of those because you need enough to put context into the future that your company wants. The more details, the more alignment that you have. And you'll see when I talk about the details and you talk about your company's culture on that day, what is the intended effect on that day? This is what our people look like. This is what they're doing. This is how the culture feels on that day in its present state. And oh, by the way, if you measure your progress to the most important things, your future, not just your past, you'll also put more context, emotional pull into the future as well. So as you're building this future, I would recommend that you keep these things in mind. So now we know where the future is. We're being pulled because it's compelling. We had all of our team members in the room to help us with it. So they understood the hows and the whys behind it. It's not just the C-suite coming up with a strategy and springing it on everybody, expecting everybody to just get behind it. So now we're bought in, we're aligned. So what? It's a great paid poster on the wall. It's a great PowerPoint. Now we have to have an intentional action we need forward momentum into the future. So we need to target the right things. Because once you come up with a shared consciousness, you're going to realize that the external market and even in your internal company, there is complexity everywhere. And a lot of companies chase a lot of things. They're task saturated and they're not focused. So one of the things I learned in the military is focus is key. But boy, it's hard to be focused in this complex environment that we all live in. So what do we want to focus on? We want to focus on only the things that will get us to that new HDD, that new future. Well, how do we know what those things are? I remember back in 1991 during Desert Storm. Maybe some of you remember that. We were going to go after the fifth largest army on Earth. And we were going to kick this guy named Saddam and his army out of this place called Kuwait. Most people couldn't find it on the map at that time and reduce the fifth largest army down to a small army and stabilize the region and work on oil and some of the other things that were going on. Our military had never done that before. And our war planners were sitting there going, this is a very risky business. We're gonna have high amounts of attrition. And one of the reasons we are gonna have those high amounts of attrition is because we realized there were over 300,000 targets to go after. 300,000, that's a lot. But instead of taking the old world mentality, and that is destroy everything, we had a clear HDD, and that was to leave in minimum amount of time with the minimum amount of casualties, both on their side and our side. So we started peeling back the onion, and we said, one of the things that we have to target is the electrical system, because that's the way the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines communicates with each other. That's the way our adversaries communicate. So we have to shut down the electricity. Well, how will we do that? Well, the old world thinking would be, Take out the power grid, all of it, the three generation plants, the transmission lines, the private companies, just target all of it. But we took a different approach and we mapped that out and we mapped the entire electrical grid out and we found out there were only five things we should really target, five centers of gravity or an afterburner, we call those critical leverage points. This is where strategic planning starts, only five. And those were step up, step down transformers. You see, when the power comes out of those generation plants, it goes into only these five step down transformers that were in rural areas throughout the country of Iraq. They were exposed and they were rarely manned. And you've probably seen these buildings before. The transmission lines go into this little uh, area and they have these exposed 
telephone poles with the ceramic on top of them. Well, we realized that we could take a cluster bomb full of tin foil and drop it on to those ceramic exposed areas and shut down or short out the step down transformer almost instantaneously. So we didn't have to destroy anything. So on night one of Desert Storm, in the first five minutes, our Stealth 117 Nighthawk fighter bombers went in, dropped those cluster bombs of tin foil on those exposed areas. And you remember Wolf Blitzer back in CNN, he famously said back then, the lights just went out in Baghdad. And in fact, the lights went out over the entire country because we targeted the right things. We weren't task saturated on everything. And we got a second or third order effect. So how do you know what to target in your markets or even internally in your business as we pivot towards our new HDD? One tool that I like to use with a clients and similar to a tool that we used in the military is understanding the impact, the value over the effort or the resources that it takes to affect change into a thing in your market. So you could easily start plotting things on this grid. Things that this grid would give your organization high value for the least amount of effort. Things over here in this grid give you high value with a lot of effort. And boy, down in this grid, lower right-hand corner, very high effort, very low value. We certainly want to avoid these things. But I see so many companies working on the old world, pre-COVID areas, that aren't giving them any value anymore, but they're still driving the organization's entire pool of effort. So I'd recommend you do what this company did. And what we'll do is we map out what we believe are some of the top critical leverage points. And as a team, target which ones get our planning and execution and resource uh, um, uh, allocation. So we only want to focus on three, four, at the most, five critical leverage points that will get us to the HDD. So that's targeting. After we target, we must get intentional about our efforts. So now that we know what the targets are, how do we go out and execute? Well, we need what we call execution rhythm. So once we identify those three critical leverage points, we need to put a plan in action, right? So we actually physically need to plan the individual actions and steps leading up to that. Now, after we plan, we don't go plan and execute, i.e. we don't plan and then jump out to the jet and fly. There's actually a step between plan and execute. And what is that step? Brief. Once we have a plan that the team uses in a team storming open planning format, we then brief the plan right before we step to the jets. Why do we do that? So many organizations continue to plan while they're executing. We don't ever stop brainstorming, stop planning. But what we need to do is after we plan, we need to have a preparatory command that says brainstorming has stopped, planning has stopped. It is now time to execute that plan. It is now time to hold individuals, you and I, accountable and who's going to do what by when. And that's what the briefing is all about. Right before we go fly, we confirm in everybody's mind that we know exactly who is going to do what by when. So we plan, we brief, and then we go out and execute. Execution should be fairly easy at this point. Why? We have a plan with contingencies. We have a good plan. We briefed it. We have that last stage of alignment and accountability, and then we need to execute. COVID 19's taught us I don't care how great the plan or the brief went, there's one thing that stands in the way of a flawlessly executed mission, and that's task saturation or task overload. And we're going to talk more about the derailers of execution here in a minute. But stay with me. This basic framework. We plan the mission, we brief the mission, we go out and execute, and as soon as the mission is over, what do we do? Go to the bar and celebrate? No way, we go right back into our room and we debrief. We debrief after every single flight. It's almost as important as the flight itself. And we debrief in a psychologically safe environment where everybody's free to admit their errors in front of their peers, supervisors, our subordinates, for the betterment of the team. This is where agility really kicks into overdrive. So we come up with a lesson learned from the debrief, and what do we do with it? We file it away for future plans, or we put it right back into the next day's plan, and we make it just a little bit tighter. And once this flywheel is engaged, plan, brief, execute, debrief, your execution levels get tighter and tighter and tighter, and you definitely will win. So I'd like to just real quick talk about planning. 
We have a six step process. I'm not gonna go into every step in great detail, but step one is problematic for a lot of organizations. You know, I've seen some organizations that have some pretty good HDDs or visions, missions, and strategies, but they still struggle to execute. And I think one of the reasons they struggle to execute is they don't take that strategy and break it down to a very short-term mission objective that's applicable to a very specific area of the business. A mission objective that's clear, measurable, achievable, and supports the overall HDD IAT line. Now, why is that? Well, I think a lot of companies don't plan the actions that it takes to get to the numbers. A lot of companies just say, hit your quarterly numbers, or this is our monthly quota, or we have to have this kind of operational rate with our, with our service or our products. But it's the actions above normal work, before, above standard work, that gets us that extra value, and that's the mission objective. Hey, our commanders don't come into a room of fighter pilots and say, win one for the Gipper, be number one over the battle space. No, they give us very clear mission objectives. Protect the airspace above our down pilot, because somebody was shot down yesterday, above the rescue zone from surface to 50,000 feet, from 1507 Zulu to 1807 Zulu. It's clear, it's measurable, it's achievable, and it applies to us. And whether you know what Zulu means or not, I know what it means, and it applies to me and the specific technicians that I have on my team to get one step closer to the HDD. So it's critical that you have mission objectives in your business. And then identify what stands in the way. External threats, internal threats, controllable threats, and uncontrollable threats. Then all you have to do is list your resources. What resources will be required to accomplish the mission objective? And I bet if you listed all the threats over here and you list your resources, you'll see that many resources that are available to you and your team can actually negate the threat or the excuses of accomplishing the mission objective. And then step number four is to evaluate lessons learned. And where do we get these lessons learned? From debriefs. If you don't have a culture of debriefing, you're not bringing those past experiences into the future to alter the future, which is critical to planning. Four steps. Look at the work that I've done before I've ever addressed who's going to do what by when. And that's step number five, where you actually put the course of action together, that spreadsheet. And once we get to this point of planning, something pretty cool happens. We stop planning. We invite another team into the room and we call that team the red team. Other fighter pilots that weren't here, they didn't fall in love with the plan, but it's an outside group. We brief them on the plan up to this point, steps one through five, and then we tell the, the red team to respectfully punch holes in our plan. And then and only then do we draft the final course of action and move on to step six, which is plan for contingencies. If I had an uncontrollable threat in step number two, I better have a step-by-step -step action to address it in step number six. If not, my team's gonna have an excuse and they're gonna fall short of the execution phase. So those six simple steps will help you with any mission, simple or complex, strategic or tactical. Please use those steps because I think they, they'll help you a lot in the long term. Now, I mentioned something earlier regardless of how well your team's doing, how great of a plan, how well that briefing went, once we start turning and burning, once we start getting real with our current client, our customers, whether we're developing software, we're engineering, task saturation will eventually raise its ugly head. And task saturation is simply the perception or the reality of having too much to do with not enough time, tools, or resources to get the mission at hand accomplished. I know you know what this is like. It affects individuals and teams. It's deadly. I have two friends that are no longer here today that flew perfectly good jets right into the ground. They hit the ground. They died relaxed. Smoking hole in the ground. Bad day for my buddies. But how in the world could the best trained pilots in the world lose track of the ground? Well, there are 350 switches and dials in the F-15 cockpit that you have to monitor. You're flying formation with two, four, six, eight wingmen. You're communicating on the radio. You're working software. You're working weapons. There's a lot of things that can task saturate the individual or the team and cause you to fly right into the ground. So what are some tools that we use to identify and mitigate task saturation, both in the cockpit, but more importantly in business? One of the tools that I want to talk to you about is called cross checks to success. 
you know, I mentioned earlier, the F-15 has 350 switches and dials inside the cockpit, only one person flying it in that front office. There's a lot of things to keep track of. But based on the mission, I was taught a simple tool called task shedding. That's where I take the 350 switches and dials and task shed to the five or six most important ones, depending on the mission. So let's say the mission today was to fly in the weather, meaning we're going to take off and be in the clouds almost the whole time. There are a lot of instruments in the cockpit that have absolutely nothing to do with flying safely in the weather. So I'm going to task shed down to these very specific instruments. And at the center of my cross check or my scan is the attitude indicator. It is a digital or an analog instrument that shows where the ground is, where the sky is, and where the horizon is, and where my jet is. So if I see more blue on this instrument than I do brown, the houses are definitely getting smaller. If I see more brown than blue, they're getting bigger. If the ball's tilted, the aircraft is in a bank or a turn. It's the number one aircraft control instrument in the cockpit. So it's right at the center. It's the first thing I look at. But in this case, I'm also gonna look at my altimeter. Am I above the mountains? I'm gonna cross check my altimeter. But notice how I'm not gonna go out and check these other instruments. I'm gonna go altimeter, bam, right back to the attitude indicator. Are my wings still level? Nope, let's make the small adjustment. Airspeed, attitude indicator. VVI, attitude indicator. Heading, attitude indicator. A very disciplined hub and spoke cross check. That's what keeps the business and the cockpit in equilibrium. So let me ask you a question. If you're a leader of a business, what's your cross check? What have you briefed your team on in this particular business cycle or the end of quota season or towards the end of the year? Do they truly know what's at the center of their cross check or more importantly, what the five or six performance instruments you're evaluating on them to be? What are they? They should be customized to your business and customized to the cycles or the markets that you're attacking, especially when we see disruption like COVID-19. So this tool is a great tool to eliminate task saturation. So let me move on. Plan using those six steps. Brief the plan, course of action. Who's gonna do what by when and the contingency plan before we go fly. So there's no question in anybody's mind what's accountable out of us as an individual as part of a team. Then we go out and execute, we turn and burn by eliminating task saturation through effective cross checks. And then we land. The most important thing that we do happens after we land. We always, always, always go into a debrief, not just if the mission goes poorly or really well, but every single time, it's almost as important as the flight itself. And here's what it looks like when you go into a fighter pilot debriefing. You walk in, there might be a one-star general, a mid-level manager, captain, and two new hires, lieutenants. And you know what? It really doesn't matter what your rank or experience level is. When it comes time to debrief, we all freely admit our errors and successes in front of each other. There's no fear of reprimand, even in the military where rank is so important. Why do we have this nameless, rankless, this organizationally safe environment only in the planning room, by the way, our debriefing room, by the way? It's to get better as a team. We know that it's not enough to identify how an error occurred but to peel back the whys and understand the psychology behind the individual errors. Because even though you and I made the error today, it might be Sue or it might be Tim tomorrow. So unless we debrief and peel back the hours, uh, uh, the layers, we're gonna repeat those mistakes. We take those lessons learned out of the debrief and we flow them right back into the next day's plan and we get a little bit better. So the key to debriefing is this, it's not who's right, it's what's right. And that's what leading high performance organizations are all about. So let's put this all together and then I'm gonna pause and uh, take questions if you have any questions. The overall framework is this. It's basically purpose, process, and platform. The purpose that your organization aligned to is a pre-planned high definition destination of the future with its measurement. Then it informs what? The strategy, targeting critical leverage points, three to five at the most. They give you the biggest bang for the buck with the least amount of effort, like those step up, step down transformers instead of all the targets that we talked about earlier. Once everybody's involved in that, the entire organization has the leader's intent. And whether you agree with it or not, you understand the hows and whys behind it and you will be pulled into this future. Now, you can't pull this off without solid platform, great people, 
Train utilizing standard operating procedures. That's scalability 101. But maybe the most important thing of all is how do we put this into accountable action? How do we start this flywheel? Planning, breaking down the HDD, the targets, and using this six-step framework. Then we brief. Last step of alignment. We execute by eliminating debt and task saturation, and we debrief all the time. What do we do with the lessons learned? Put them back into the next day's plan, store them for future use. And when you do that and you do it faster and faster, you stay at the same rate of change or slightly ahead of it, and you will win. It's all about developing the right future, the right strategy, and then more importantly, executing. Two parts to your success. So in closing, I want to wish each and every one of you happy hunting. It's been great being part of this conference. Uh, I want to thank Mike and Kathy for all the great work that we did behind the scenes to make this possible. And I'd love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn. We push out a lot of content about flawless execution. You can find me on LinkedIn under James D. James D. Murphy. James D. is in Delta Murphy or under flawless execution. And with that, I want to say thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy for Q&A.